You're listening to the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast, episode number 116. Welcome to the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast. Business advice so easy, you'll feel like you're cheating. And now your host, Amy Porterfield. Welcome back to another episode of the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast. I'm your host, Amy Porterfield. Thank you so very, very much for being here. Now, in today's episode, we are going to go behind the scenes of my most recent launch of my newest program, Courses That Convert. Now, the timing of this recording is so perfect because tomorrow morning, my husband, Hobie, and I are leaving for a mini vacation to Mexico. And this mini vacation is to celebrate reaching the finish line of my brand new program. I wanted to share that with all of you because those of you who are in my program courses that convert know that what I do in the very beginning is encourage you to choose a deadline. So you know, when you're going to complete your course, and then I have you decide how you're going to celebrate. Once you meet that milestone, this little Mexico getaway is my celebration for meeting my deadline. Now, what I want to add here is that in the early days, when I would plan a little celebration like this, I was a little bit more strapped for cash. So instead of planning a Mexico getaway, I had plan a fun dinner out with my husband or maybe a spa day with my girlfriends. So they weren't always this fancy, but as my business has grown, I've definitely upped the game a little bit with my getaways and celebrations and all that good stuff when I met some deadlines. So just remember if you're starting out, baby steps. Now, as I mentioned, today is all about pulling back the curtain of my most recent launch and sharing with you what worked well, and also examining some missteps along the way. But before I get into all the details, I thought it would be helpful to set the stage, help you better understand what the launch looked like overall. So here's the breakdown. The launch was in two phases. We did a pre-launch phase that lasted for about two weeks And then we went into the launch phase In the launch phase. That's when the cart opens and the cart closes. So the cart opened on May 4th. And for me, cart open means my first live webinar where I sell my program. The cart closed on May 17th. During that time, I did six live webinars plus one live webinar to a segment of my past customers. And I'll drill down on who they were and why I did that a little bit later. I also did not use affiliates. Now I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but when I launch a brand new program, I typically only launch to my own list just in case there's some things I need to work out and I don't want to affect the partner that I'm working with. So I didn't use affiliates. The entire launch was fueled by my own list and my Facebook ad efforts. In addition to that, during that pre-launch phase, I mentioned we did two podcast episodes dedicated to course creation topics. And then in those podcast episodes, I linked to the registration page for my live webinars. We also did one epic blog post, which I teach about a lot, writing an epic blog post, something people would want to share. And with that, we included a freebie and we ran ads to it for about two weeks leading up to the launch phase. The program was $997 or we had a 12 pay of 97. So just two options, 997 or a 12 pay of 97. Now we also did an upsell. It was $297. It was a slide deck template. And basically what we did is we had my designer create a series of slide decks that would work well for course creators. And that was an upsell. Once people bought, they saw that offer as well. So that was part of the final revenue numbers. And speaking of final revenue numbers, this launch proved to be my most successful to date. We hit a little over 1.95 million. So almost $2 million in revenue for this launch. Pretty incredible for sure. I never take that lightly. And I'm really proud of my entire team for all their hard work and dedication. Now I have to admit that I'm always a little uncomfortable throwing out numbers to launches, I guess for a few reasons. One, I know where I was just a few years back. And when I would hear those really big numbers, I'd get excited about the potential for my own business, 
But I'd also look at my own business and think, how am I ever going to get there? I feel like small potatoes based on the numbers that person just threw out. And, you know, where do I fit in this whole mix of online marketing? And will I ever get there? And so I started to doubt myself a lot when I would hear numbers like that. So I guess I'm sensitive to it because I just want to remind you that I have been at this for a long time. And so you can't compare your business today where my business is now, because we're likely on different journeys. We likely started at different times. We have very different life experiences and everybody does this differently. And sometimes it takes people a lot longer or a lot shorter. I think I'm probably right there in the middle. I've been doing it since 2009. So just remember that this takes time. Now, I also wanted to throw out there that getting to a $2 million launch obviously doesn't happen by luck. Meaning not only do I think it takes time to get there, but I also think it takes a lot of long-term strategic planning. Like I said, some of you will get there a whole lot faster than I did, but others, it might take some trial and error along the way. And I'm talking over a series of years and that's okay. Because when I did $30,000 on my first launch, I feel like I was just as excited about that as I was for 2 million because the mindset is still the same. Holy cow. People want my programs. They love what I'm doing. This is actually working. I cracked a code like that excitement still feels the same. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Now, also I'll tell you that the goal of this episode is to give you an, in the trenches, here's what worked view of my recent launch. Take what you like, leave what does not serve you right now in your business and use all of this to fuel you, to keep you moving forward in your own business. That's truly how I hope you use this episode. So let's go ahead and dive in. So let me give you a breakdown of how this episode is going to go, because I feel like it's a little bit of a beast. I think it took me four hours to prepare, just pulling all the information together, organizing it for you, thinking about it, talking to my team, getting their feedback. So just bear with me that there's a lot to cover here. So I thought it would be helpful to kind of tell you where we're going with this. So first we're going to look at my launch team. I often get asked, Amy, what does your team look like during a launch and how is that different than every day inside your business? So I'm going to share with you what my team looks like. Next, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the mindset of launching and how you need to prepare yourself for any launch that you do big or small. After that, I'll share with you how we set up our webinar registration options to protect ourselves against any tech issues and possible launch problems. From there, I'm going to share with you how to personalize your launch message in two different ways to ensure you grab the attention of the perfect ideal customer for your program. And then I'm going to share with you the two big missteps in my launch what they were and how we were able to bounce back from them pretty quickly. I mean, not perfectly bounce back from them, but we were able to hustle a little bit to correct things as fast as humanly possible. Now, these are some good lessons. One of the missteps that I'm thankful we were able to salvage was with my closing day emails. And so the freebie for today's episode will be the actual email copy that I wrote for our final cart closing emails. I wanted to show you what worked. And also I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I tweaked them at the last minute to make sure they actually worked. So the actual freebie today is my swipe copy from my closing cart day emails. And I'll tell you how to get your hands on that in a little bit. And then finally, I'll close things up with a discussion on my Facebook ad experience. I'll tell you how much money we spent in our ads brace yourself. I'll tell you about what worked with our ads, what wasn't working, and just give you some insight for your next ad strategy as well. So as I mentioned, I've got a lot to share. So first let's talk about what my launch team looked like. I always say that I have a small, but mighty team. And as of today, I only have two full-time employees. One was just hired on June one. And then I have some really amazing part-time employees as well. But for my launches, we definitely bulked up on the team support in many different ways. So let me give you a rundown. 
First, you probably have heard me mention this before, but I have at all times a full-time project manager. She's been with me for about one year now. Her name is Chloe. She's fantastic. And this was her second biggest launch. So in many ways, she totally ran the show for the courses that convert product launch. Now, for the first time, I really do feel like I was hands off on many aspects of this launch. Now, let me preface that with saying that I was hands off until it came time to review. Since we now have this launch strategy down, Chloe knew what to do, how to move forward, what to look for. So she was able to manage so many moving pieces. Now, to be specific, she manages the creation of multiple webinar registration pages, multiple sales pages, email copy, order forms, and of course, a million other things. She manages our designer, Jess, and all the aspects of what Jess does. She also manages the programmers and the coders and any extra contractors that we might bring on. She works inside Infusionsoft with my business partner, Devin. So she's extremely hands-on. So that's why she needs to be full-time. And it's nice that she's been through a few different launches, one big launch with webinars that convert and a few smaller ones as well. So she was definitely prepared to take this on. So very proud of her. She did an excellent job. So that helped me immensely, but I want to point out I've been launching for a long time. And I just shared with you that this is the first launch that I feel like I was really hands off in the creation of all the materials. And I got to step in at two points. One, when we first conceptualized everything, you know, what was our message going to be? What did the whole strategy look like? I was part of that, of course. And then I was able to pull back a bit, continue to work on creating my product and then come back in when my product was completed and review everything in terms of the messaging, the sales page, the webinar registration, all that good stuff. So my job during a launch is in two parts. One, I do all of the course creation. I edit all of my videos for the course creation. And I of course have a huge say in how we're going to message the entire launch around the product I just created. So I do all content creation in terms of podcast, blog post. I work really closely with the copywriter. So I'll talk to you about that. And so I'm involved at that level. And then I'm also very much involved in the webinar creation. So I completely create my own webinar content. I put together all my own slides after I have a slide deck template created for me, but I put together all my own slides and I work out that entire thing. And anybody who's in my webinars course knows that it takes me a while to create a webinar for a launch, at least a good solid week, sometimes even a little bit more. So content creation is definitely my place in my business. And then of course, overseeing everybody as a team and reviewing all the stuff that we are creating for the launch. Okay. So moving from Chloe, we also have three main support people at all times during a launch. So we use Rhino as our support tool for emails. And so we have one gal that will answer all the emails that come in through our support desk during a launch. Now, this is the same gal. Her name's Kate that does it when we're not in a launch, but she ups her hours. She's more available because we get a lot of emails asking questions about the program or challenges with getting on the webinar or challenges with anything. We want to make sure that we get back to people really quickly since we are in launch mode and it only goes for about two weeks anyway. So we're fully staffed during that time. Also, my support team is managing live chat during a webinar and live chat on our sales pages. So that's a big one as well. Not every single hour of the launch, but at peak hours for sure. And then throughout the day, they'll get pinged when someone might jump on a sales page and have a question. And then also we hired a designer. Jess is my designer. I absolutely love her. I've talked about her a bunch and she did all the branding for the actual course and then for the actual launch as well. So we're talking webinar registration pages, sales pages, logos, webinar templates, email graphics, tons of stuff. If you're in any of my courses, you have received a graphic list of all the graphics that you might need during a course creation process and during a launch. 
So that's all Jess. So she is one busy bee. We usually have her for a project basis. So we'll say, okay, we need you for, let's say a good 30 or 60 days. Here's all the stuff we want you to work on. And she gives us a project fee. So that tends to be how we work with Jess during launches. And then from there, we have a programmer, a coder to build out our webinar registration pages. We don't use lead pages during launches because we do a lot of custom stuff with them. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So we get those all custom designed. We get a sales page custom designed. So we need a designer programmer slash coder for all of that. Okay. And I promise I won't keep harping on this, but those of you who know me well know this is a sensitive point for me. I tell you all this, but I did not have custom registration pages and custom sales pages and custom order forms when I was just starting out. This is something I've grown into. So inside my courses, when I teach it, I'll say, okay, yes, mine's custom, but if you're in your first few years of business, you don't have the budget to do so. I love lead pages. I love Sam cart for my order forms. And I usually give you the tools that I love to not go custom until you're ready to kind of go to that next level. So I promise I won't keep harping on that, but it's just like the sensitive part with me that I like to take care of you, I guess, if you're just starting out and I don't want to overwhelm you. Okay. So moving on with my team, we also hired somebody to build out my members area. Now we use wishlist and optimize press. We have from the get go, we've thought about changing to some other different platforms, but it's a big to do to change out all your stuff. Cause everything is integrated with my member site, meaning my funnels Infusionsoft, my order forms. I mean, there's just a lot of integration. So we haven't moved, although, you know, wishlist and optimize press have served us well, but I had somebody come in not only to set that up, but to customize it. So if you're in courses that convert, there's some customization that's going on there from Chris Barber, who I've talked about in my programs before. So he gets in there and he helps me make it look really good. And then I also have a copywriter and my copywriter works on my launch materials, including sales pages and emails. His name is Rai Schwartz. I absolutely love him. And I get to work really closely with him and go back and forth in terms of what the program's all about, who's it for, what the messaging is. And he's worked with me on a few launches now. I think this would be my third. So he really nailed it with this one. And I'm just so pleased to work with him. I think he is a genius in many, many ways. And he's a lot of fun to work with. But again, I haven't always had a copywriter. This is something new over the last year or so. And then moving on, we had a full-time Facebook ads manager that ran all of our ads. So he's been working with us for over a year now. And so he did a lot of experimentation, a lot of testing, a lot of research. And I actually had him give me feedback about our ad experience. And I have some really cool things to share with you about what worked, what didn't work, and just what you can apply to your next ad strategy based on what we did inside this launch. So we're going to get there for sure. I told you it's a lot. So this episode is a beast. So I'm going to try to get through some of this very quickly so that you can apply it to your business and you don't feel overwhelmed. That is my goal. Okay. So let's jump in to strategy. Number one that I wanted to share with you. I have five strategies already ran through them when I kind of gave you where we're going with this, but strategy number one is to be in launch mode. And this is around the mindset of launching. So when I say be in launch mode, what I mean by that is when you're launching, you are doing just that you're launching and you are not doing anything else. Now, the way to make this work is that you need to look at your calendar way in advance. So we knew this was on the calendar back in October of 2015. And to be quite honest with you, just to kind of give you a little flexibility in what you're doing, we actually moved it by two weeks. I needed a good, actually it could have been three weeks. I needed a little extra time with finishing my program. And so because of that, I said, okay, guys, I need to finish this program. I need to focus here. We need to move this off just a little bit. So we tweaked the schedule a little bit just to make sure that we were ready. So I feel like that happens a lot. Just don't let yourself move it too far in advance that you're never even getting to it. But anyway, I wanted to share that with you, but back to getting in launch mode, I looked at my calendar. I knew when we were launching and everything else gets taken off my calendar during those 
two weeks, especially when the cart is open, that's all I'm doing. Now this works in two ways. Number one, it allows you to be totally on, like give 110% of your energy to the launch. Now, what I love about that is it allows you to be flexible. It allows you to jump in, in areas that you didn't know you would need to. It allows you some late nights, although they're not pretty, it happens. So it allows you to totally be all in and not have to worry about a million other things. So that means that you don't want to be traveling to some networking event during a launch. It means you don't want to be doing some random interviews on other people's podcasts. If it doesn't pertain to your launch, you don't want to take clients during that time. And you don't want to plan any parties with your friends during that time. Of course, you need to take care of your family and take care of yourself during that time. But all the other work stuff should go away as much as possible. And so what that allowed for me was that when I had an idea to start using Facebook live more, it came around the time that we launched. So I finally made the commitment. I talked about this on another episode. I went to social media marketing world, really bought into the conversation that Facebook live is where it's at. And I do agree with that. And it was right before we launched. So I thought I'm doing it. So because I had freed up my calendar, I was able to wake up in the morning and think, you know what? I'm going to do a Facebook live today. We're in launch mode. I'm going to talk about this topic. I was able to sit down, formulate it all, get on Facebook live and do a good job. But if I had a million other things going beyond my launch, I wouldn't have had the space to think about how I wanted to use Facebook live during my launch. And that was kind of like a last minute thing. So I love that I had the space to do so. In addition to that, being in launch mode, You want to make sure that you prepare yourself, meaning that your fridge is full of really good food that will keep you fueled. And maybe you have a conversation with your spouse that we're moving into a rough time. I'm going to be a little less available if that's something that you're able to do in your life and maybe even ask for extra support. So I said this on the last time I reviewed a launch with webinars that convert that my mom who lives five minutes away. She was extra helpful. She'd come over, she'd take Gus for walks while I was super busy on webinars. She'd even cook me lunch once in a while. Um, She just made sure that I was taken care of. She'd help me pick up Cade from school if I happened to be on a webinar. So that's all the stuff that you want to look at the calendar, think about what, where you're going to need a little extra support. And if you can ask for it. I also want to let you know that when I'm in launch mode, I do a 15 minute check-in call with my team every morning. Now I hate these calls because I don't like set meetings every morning. I shouldn't say I hate them. They're not my favorite, but they're usually early, like around 7 AM, 8 AM. This time we were even able to push them till 9 AM, which is great. But when you do these launch calls, it's just a quick check-in. Usually one person manages them. In this case, it was Chloe, our project manager. So we jump on, it would be our support team. So it'd be Travinia and Kate and Lindsay and Kim. So I had four people, but usually it was three people on at all times. And then Chloe would jump in and I'd be there. So we'd say, okay, Chloe, go with it. She'd give us an update. She'd tell us any place where we might be having a problem. Travinia would fill us in on what potential customers were saying, the questions they were asking, where they might be getting stuck, which helped me formulate my Q&A during a webinar because I started to hear where customers might have had questions already. So this happened during the entire launch from the day the cart opened to the day the cart closed, except on weekends, we did not get on calls. Okay. So there you go. Number one strategy for you is be in launch mode, clear your calendar, be present, make it all about your customers during that time, and you'll be able to be flexible when things pop up. Number two, hedge your bets. Now by that, I mean that you want to make sure that you don't put all your eggs in one basket. And I'm specifically talking here about our webinar registration strategy. Now, before I started to record this episode, I went to my business partner, Devin Duncan, and I said, Dev, what do you think worked really well with this launch? And one of the things that he brought up to me is that he said, okay, we did six live webinars. And when we advertise those live webinars, we did not put all six times on the registration page. Instead, we just did two at a time. So one reg page would list the first two times. The next reg page would list the next two times. And when we started to promote about seven days in advance, when we started to promote the webinars, we would actually split that. 
So half of the ads would go to registration page number one, half of the ads would go to registration page number two. So at all times we were filling up the first four webinars. The last two webinars were closer to cart close. So when we were in pre-launch mode, filling up our webinars, we weren't even sending people to those last two webinars. They were too far off on the calendar. So we focused on the first four webinars and we split them 50, 50 with our ad traffic because we wanted to fill them up evenly. And this is something that actually was a strategy from Devin. He said, I didn't want to front load. I didn't want most of the people to be in those first two webinars. And there's a few reasons for that. One, I am not my best on the very first webinar. No matter how much I practice until I'm totally live, I can't really identify the areas that aren't flowing so perfectly, the areas that I'd like to change, ways I want to tweak my webinar. And my webinar is everything to this launch because it's the only way we sell. Meaning you get on a webinar, you hear about the program after I teach you some stuff, and then we go into our email marketing. So it has to be good. So because of that, Dev knows, I want to give you a little bit of time to warm up, which is why we do a webinar. One of the reasons why we do a webinar to a segmented customer list. I'll talk about that in the next little strategy I give you, but we'll come back to that later. What I want to share with you here is that we didn't front load partly because of the reason that sometimes it takes me a while to warm up. Another reason was he said, if we actually came out and we gave all the times to people, people typically go for those first two times. So that would have front loaded it. And Dev said that, what if we had a technical issue, which we actually did with one of our first webinars. He said, if you have a technical issue now, you are really going to have a challenge in terms of getting sales in right away. If let's say the order form's not working or something's wrong with the webinar and they can't hear you. And then the majority of people were on that first webinar. Typically we can work out a tech challenge right away and then we won't have to have it for the webinars to come afterwards. So that was another reason why he didn't want everybody signing up for those first two webinars. So I really love this strategy in that he broke up the first four webinars. They were pretty even. So let's say we had 2000 people in the first webinar. We typically had 2000 in the next, the next, and the next. So it worked out really well across the board. And I like that strategy. So if you're going to do multiple live webinars, which I suggest to all my students inside webinars that convert, I want to encourage you to possibly kind of spread it out a little bit. Now, yes, that meant we needed multiple registration pages. That was more work, of course, but I think it was worth it. Okay. So moving on to strategy number three, make it personal. So make it personal is all about making your message resonate with your perfect ideal audience. And there were two ways that we were able to do this in this launch. The first way, and you actually experienced this if you signed up for one of my webinars, after you signed up for my webinar, I took you to a thank you page. And on that thank you page was a survey. And again, this was all custom, but there's ways to do it like with survey monkey as well. So the survey was just a one question survey. And it was something like, you know, what's the number one reason that has stopped you from either creating your course or finishing your course? So it was related to course creation. And so we had a bunch of different options they can choose. And then the last one was other, and they could actually fill in the blank. So the options were like, not enough time. I don't know where to start. I'm not comfortable teaching inside a course, whatever it might've been. They were typically the challenges I hear from my students most often. So we gave them three or four options to choose and then one to fill in the blank. And so what was really cool is Rye, my copywriter, then wrote one specific email for each of those challenges. So you likely didn't even notice this, but if you signed up for my, one of my webinars, the emails that followed those webinars, one of those emails was very specific to the challenge. If you did choose a challenge, the challenge on the thank you page. So that challenge might've been, I don't know how to do the techie stuff. So Rye wrote this really fun email about how we all get stuck in the tech. And sometimes you want to get a pinata of the MailChimp mascot 
and beat it to the ground. And so we talked about technology with email marketing and webinars and course creation and how that's very frustrating and how my course will take that frustration out immediately and how it will take the frustration away. So it was very specific to your challenge. Did that mean that it was more work for us to create those emails? Heck yeah. Poor Rye was writing like a crazy guy, but I think it was really valuable to get personal at that level. This is the first time I did that. I definitely will do it again. And I liked how we were able to personalize in the middle of the launch through our email communication. Now, if they chose the other one, it was interesting for me to see all of the reasons that people actually typed in. So that was good research for me, but also we had kind of a general email ready for that. If that's the one people chose. Now, another way we made my launch personal was, and I've mentioned this a few times, we did one separate personal webinar for a segment of my audience. Now that segment were those that were already in my webinars that convert program. So I have over 2,300 people, if not more inside my webinars that convert program. And so I wanted to do a webinar just for them for multiple reasons. Now, one selfish reason and not the most important reason, but one selfish reason is that Like I said, I'm not best on my first webinar. It takes me a while to work out some of the things that I want to say in the flow of my webinar. And so I like to do a webinar to my customers because quite honestly, they're more forgiving. They allow for some mistakes that I wouldn't want to do in front of somebody that doesn't have any connection with me whatsoever. So if I'm going to mess up on something, I'd rather do it with somebody that trusts me and knows that I know my stuff. And so again, they're more forgiving. So that's kind of the selfish, less important reason why I do that. Another reason why I do that is that I get to speak in a different, very personal language to my customers. One, I get to talk to them as though they're part of my family, which is kind of a cool thing. Like you guys know me, you know, I talk about this or that, or, you know, I've taught this. So they have that connection with me instantly. So it's actually a more fun conversation to have. Now, in addition to that, these people bought webinars that convert, meaning they are going to promote a course online inside their webinar. And I know a lot of them joined webinars that convert, but they weren't yet finished with their course. A lot of them had started a course, but hadn't finished it. So I thought if that's the case, then they're going to love this new program. So the messaging on webinars that convert was more toward an audience that I said, look, you probably have started this, but you haven't reached the finish line. Here's how courses that convert will get you to that finish line. Whereas if it was a cold audience, I'd probably talk more about how courses that convert will help you get started and then reach that finish line because the program does both. So it was a different conversation and I also can offer them maybe a special bonus or something extra because they're a customer. So you don't have to go that route, but that's also another option. So I just wanted to put it out there that going to your existing customers during a launch and having a different, more personal conversation with them makes a huge difference. And we have so many webinars that convert members inside courses that convert. And if that's you, thank you so very much for putting your trust in me again and joining another program. And I really do believe that the two programs together are exactly what you need to just have amazing results in your business. I have no doubt. And I literally designed them to do so. Okay. Moving on to our fourth strategy, and that is do what works. Now, this is something that I've been talking about for a long time. No need to reinvent the wheel in your business. Continue to figure out what works and then do it again and again and again. And I talk about this all the time, but sometimes I have missteps and I don't follow my own strategies in my own lessons. And in this case, it happened twice during this launch. So this strategy, do what works is based on two missteps that I had along the way. So my motto in my business is always to keep things simple. You likely will never see me doing a launch with 50 different moving parts that are crazy complicated. That's just not me. I always start with creating a solid offer with highly desirable trainings and bonuses included in in that offer. And as I mentioned in the intro, my launches usually consist of pre-launch free content 
that I really take seriously. I make sure that it's really good. And then I do multiple free live webinars. And then I do a lot of Facebook ad goodness and then heavy segmented email marketing. So that typically is how I do launches. I've gotten pretty good about my entire launch strategy from start to finish. But again, even though I've done this a lot, I still obviously like everybody make mistakes. So one of my missteps with this launch was something that I was able to salvage at the last minute. Thank goodness. And I really want to thank my team for that as well. But here's what it was in my past launches. We've always created a 48 hour fast action bonus. I did it with webinars that convert during the launch. I did it with my B-School launch recently. Basically, in the middle of the launch, I pick two days and I do a special bonus that you can only get for 48 hours. So if you already purchased, you're going to get that bonus. But if you are still on the fence, if you purchase between this 48-hour time frame, you also get an extra special bonus. The reason we do that is that at that point, a lot of people are on the fence and they need a little boost to say, okay, I'm in or yeah, I'm not going to do this. I'm out. And so for all those that are sitting on the fence in the middle of a launch, things get a little bit slow. If you don't have a reason to email them with a new opportunity, they've already heard your pitch. They've likely been on your webinar. They've seen some of your emails. They're just kind of sitting there. Not sure yet. So I like to give them a reason to take action and it always works really well. It's usually a really desirable bonus. And I love doing this, but for some reason we totally missed it in courses that convert. We didn't have one prepared. So about two days leading up to it, I think it was Devin that said, okay, do we have a fast action bonus that's going to go out on these two days? And Chloe and I looked at each other like, uh, no, I don't know how we missed that. Cause Devin typically doesn't get involved in the content creation of the emails and stuff. So he wasn't aware of it, but we totally missed it. So those calls are incredibly valuable for just that. Now, at this point, we had some options and I want to run through these options with you about what we could have done with this 48 hour bonus misstep and then tell you why we chose the one we chose. So option number one is we could have said total bummer. We didn't plan a 48 hour bonus. It's too late. Now we have a plan in place. We need to stick to our plan. We can't veer off our plan. So we are just not going to do it. We'll do it next time. And we didn't do that because we knew that this fast action bonus in the middle of a launch works. That was just leaving too much money on the table. And it was just a silly thing not to do it. Now, option number two is we could have squeezed in the 48 hour bonus and then changed around a bunch of the follow-up emails, because here's the deal. We actually wrote all of the follow-up emails in advance, of course. And so because of that, If we actually added a 48 hour bonus, we'd have to change a lot of the follow-up emails. They wouldn't have made sense. They referenced different dates, different times, different deadlines, and it just would have messed up a lot of the emails to follow. So adding a 48 hour bonus at the time when we discovered we had missed it, it was going to be extremely taxing on my team. And even beyond that, there was a lot of room for error. Because if we tweaked one email, forgot this other email, it's in a campaign already, it could have really just messed up our entire email sequence. And that made me very nervous. So I didn't love that option. So doing it exactly how we did it last year with webinars that convert, I just didn't think that was the best way to go. So the third option, the one we went with is that we decided we could do something similar. We could adapt. So instead of doing the 48 hours, which just wasn't going to fit into our schedule, we could do a 24 hour bonus. And so this actually was perfect because at that point I had gotten to hear a lot of the objections, why people weren't ready to sign up. I got to hear a lot of the questions people asked because I was doing live webinars at that point. We were in the middle of the launch. So I knew the questions they were asking. I knew where their concerns were. And so I actually had more information than I would have had weeks before if I had planned this bonus then. So there was a silver lining here. So I knew that people were really into creating the course. They love that. They were most concerned about, okay, what happens after I create a course? 
Are you going to talk about launching? And many people knew that I had an entire course separate from courses that convert all about launching with webinars. So they wanted to know, am I going to get any launching how to inside courses that convert? And there are tons of bonuses about launching inside courses that convert, but I knew that this was a hot topic. So I created a live workshop that for 48 hours, if you signed up during this time, you could get this online live workshop where I dive a little bit deeper into launching. So that's exactly what it was. And I was able to create something really specific because I was listening to my potential customers. So again, a silver lining, but also we didn't do 48 hours. We probably would have done even better if we had that full 48 hours, but we did a 24 hour bonus and it did incredibly well. Like I was so pleased with it and definitely moved the needle on those that were kind of still sitting on the fence. So just wanted to throw that out there that one, I think fast action bonuses in the middle of a launch are incredibly important. Ideally you want to create them in advance. Like there's a silver lining that I knew exactly what kind of bonus I wanted to create because I was listening to my customers but it was very stressful trying to pull it together at the last minute. I don't suggest that. So look at, let's say if you're going to launch for two weeks, look at the middle section and find two days. Usually I like to do it on a Thursday and Friday, but you can do it whenever Monday, Tuesday, whatever works. But I do like that strategy in general. And so then you just need to tag people appropriately, figure out the best way to do that, knowing when they bought, they get a special tag. So you can go back and deliver that extra special bonus. Okay. So the moral of the story on that one is continue to do what works and really look over your entire launch strategy and make sure you didn't leave anything out from past launches that you've done that have worked really well for you. So moving on to the second misstep of this launch, and this one is all about email marketing. Now I've said this before, but on cart closing day, we typically send out three emails. And yes, that feels aggressive. And I remember the first time I did it, I wanted to hide under my desk, but there's no way I would ever turn back and not do it. It works really, really well. So on the final day, we had almost $500,000 come in just on that final day. And so it was a big day for us, for sure. Cart closes always a big day. It typically is bigger, but when you do those fast action bonuses in the middle, I think that it takes away a little bit from that final cart close day which is fine. It all comes out in the wash, but we had a big day, but we really almost screwed ourselves where we might not have had such a good day if we didn't catch this mistake. So here's what happened. I had Rye write our final cart close emails because he's our copywriter and they were amazing. Beautiful. Rye is such a genius copywriter that he can weave in these awesome stories with also connecting with the emotions that my potential students are feeling right then and there before they buy. And so he's able to connect with them at a level I've never seen a copywriter able to do, which is what I love about him. But what I failed to tell Rye is that those final emails on the final day need to be really short to the point. And the whole goal is to get them to click, to go to the sales page, to read one final time, make a decision and buy. But I didn't tell him that. And so I had him write emails that were based more on stories and examples and just overall benefits of the program. And so when the first email went out on the morning of cart close, I noticed that we didn't see a big surge in sales, which we typically would. And so Devin went back and looked at the email and he said, you know, the goal of that email was not, Hey, this is your final day. Countdown timers going you got to make a decision. It really wasn't based around that goal of getting people to click, check out the sales page and buy. And so I looked at the other two emails and I quickly tweaked them. Now, again, this isn't a Rye mistake. This is an Amy mistake. I didn't communicate properly because as I said, Rye and I have a lot of conversations. Yes, he might be the mastermind of writing them, but it's my voice. It's my message. So I communicate a lot to him and I just missed the mark with this one. And Here's what's crazy about this. I've done final emails on launches for years now. And for some reason, I just didn't communicate this one right. And I don't know why, but we kind of amaze ourselves sometimes, right? Like, how did I make that mistake? Like, I should have known. I don't know. Maybe I was thinking of something else. I wasn't totally focused. Maybe I was too focused on another strategy we were working on. I'm not really sure, but I missed the boat here. 
So we quickly looked at the second and third email that was going to go out and we tweaked them. So I put countdown timers in those emails, which I think is a huge must. If you're going to send three emails on final day, I would put at least the countdown timers in two. So if you've seen any of my emails during the launch, we actually have a countdown timer that's ticking away inside of your inbox. So when you open up the email, you actually see it ticking away. So it creates that sense of urgency and scarcity because it's true. The cart's closing. Like at the time that I'm recording this, you cannot buy courses that convert the cart closed. And so when I wanted to add some timers in there and the second thing is I wanted to shorten them up and just really focus on, you've got to make a decision. Now's the time. And so what I want to share with you as the freebie are the three emails. I'm actually going to tweak the first one to make sure that it reads as it should have, because it actually went out not really reading as it should have. So I'll tweak the first email and then send you the actual second and third emails that went out. And so that's my freebie for this episode, because I thought it would be valuable for you to see what works in terms of final cart close emails, because they worked really well. Once we tweak things, we were off to the races. We had a great final day. So if you go to amyporterfield.com forward slash 116 download, or you text the phrase 116 download to the number 33444, I'll give you my swipe file. I'll give you those final three emails that we sent on closing day. So you can kind of just see them in action. Now, of course, you're not going to copy these. Of course, you're not going to take them word by word and work them into your own launch. Because as you know, this is my own voice, my own style, and we work really hard to create the content during a launch. So please do not use them word for word, but just use them as a guide. So you can kind of see them in action. I always say I'm a show and tell kind of girl. I want to show you exactly what we did and not just tell you. So please, you know, just be careful with how you use those. One quick side note to all of that is that in the final emails at the last minute, I added a PS. I think it might've been an email one or two where I talked about the fact that I was going live on my Facebook page that day to answer any final questions if you were still on the fence. And so you want to do that earlier in the morning or in the afternoon and not wait for the last email, of course. And so we actually linked to my Facebook page, told them exactly what time I was going live. And that definitely, I think, made a big difference as well. We actually use Facebook Live on cart close day twice. My team, they are crazy. And they thought that the first time I did Facebook Live worked really well. I was able to answer a lot of questions. People were really engaged. I did that probably around four or five in the afternoon because cart closed at midnight. And then they encouraged me to get back on around 10 or 1030, which I like go to bed at 10. So that was very, very late for me. But of course on cart close day, I stay up till midnight. So I'm like, all right, I'm up, let's do this. And so we did it one more time, which was really cool. Now, I don't know if this is right or wrong, but I also wanted to share a little thing that I do with Facebook live. If I'm going to go on Facebook live on my Facebook page, and I'm going to talk about something that's incredibly timely, like the cart is closing, or I went on Facebook live and talked about that 24 hour bonus. That was another thing that helped us immensely because I didn't do a 48 hour bonus in only 24 hours. I went live on my Facebook page and did an FB live all about the fact that that bonus was going away in just a few hours. So with that video and the cart closing videos, I actually deleted them when the launch closed. And I don't know if that's bad or good, meaning like, I don't know if it affects the algorithm on my Facebook page or whatever, but I didn't want those videos on my Facebook page. And then somebody coming to my Facebook page for the first time, looking through all my stuff, watching my videos and hearing about stuff that they could not participate in. And so I just didn't want them sitting on my page. And I also don't want to do a bunch of FB live that are all salesy. Like it was during a launch. Of course, I'm going to sell more during the launch, but I don't want that to be what my Facebook live videos are all about. So if they were really salesy, meaning like I was going for it, which there's nothing wrong with that. But if that was the point of the FB live to get people to a sales page, I typically would delete those afterwards. Again, if I hear something like that's a really bad idea for my algorithm, I'll share it with you guys, but I just went for it. Okay. So the moral of the story of this misstep is that you can't get it all right. No matter how many times you're going to launch, there's always going to be mistakes and 
If you're in launch mode, kind of working back to that very first strategy I shared with you. And if you're meeting with your team on a daily basis, if not more than once a day, I mean, I talk to my team 20 times a day throughout the day during a launch, but we have that one specific meeting. If you're in constant communication with them, you're going to catch these missteps and be as flexible as you can without taxing your team or changing the entire launch at the last minute. But if you can make some tweaks to fix these mistakes, by all means, go for it. Okay. So we're moving in to the final stretch and with this final strategy, number five, it's all about optimizing your Facebook ads in the pre-launch stage. So that's what we're going to focus on. So here's the deal. I got to talk to Devin and Jonathan, my Facebook ads manager about this section, because again, I didn't run all my Facebook ads. So I wanted to make sure that I got feedback from them because they were in the trenches here. So when it comes to launches, Devin's recommendation is to clearly define your pre-launch stage and your launch stage. Now, pre-launch is the marketing that happens before the cart opens. So people can't buy during that stage, but you're getting their buy-in on your overall message. It includes a lot of free content, like I talked about, like that epic blog post and the podcast episodes I did around content creation. And when doing webinars, this is the most important part in the pre-launch stage, your number one focus is to fill up your webinars with quality people. So of course you're creating this free content during pre-launch, but your number one focus is to get people to sign up for your webinar before you go live with it. So again, when talking to Devin, he'll tell you that the success of your launch, especially if you're using Facebook ads to fill up a webinar is predetermined in the pre-launch stage. So here's what I mean. When I asked Dev what he felt about the big wins of our launch, he said that he felt like this launch, we had more confidence in our ad spend than we've ever had with any other launch. This was the first time that we all felt incredibly confident in spending a big chunk of our launch budget on ads because we were really certain about the outcome. We knew that if we were able to use our ads to attract a certain number of people to our webinars, because we've done it so many times, we knew roughly where we would convert with those webinars. So we could predict our launch revenue before we got there. So we kind of knew where we'd end up. Now we ended up farther than we thought we'd end up, but that's a good thing, right? That's a quality problem there, but we roughly kind of knew what was going to happen. So brace yourself. We spent $150,000 on Facebook ads and Instagram ads as well. Yes, you heard me right. $150,000. Now I remember in the early days when I spent $10,000 on a launch campaign with Facebook ads and wanted to die. Like I thought I was going to throw up the entire time. And I remember talking to Rick Mulready, my good friend, who's like my Facebook ads go-to guy. He's on my podcast a lot. I remember when he spent his first few thousand dollars on ads like that, like maybe it was 10,000. And I remember he was freaking out and he's an ads expert. So a lot of us go through this when we're first running ads, when you don't have a lot of data and a lot of experience to pull from, sometimes it feels like, is this going to work or not? I'm not even sure, but I believe in Facebook ads. So I'm going to go for it. And I just want to put it out there that many of us feel that way for a few years. I think I felt that way. I mean, I knew they were working, but I always was just like a little bit nervous, but working with Devin more and more, he's like the numbers guy. I am not a numbers girl. I do not like analytics. And so that's a little bit rough for me in my business to kind of dig into all of that, but Devin does it well. And so he knew that if he crunched the numbers, he'd kind of figure out how much we can spend and what the results would look like. So Devin's goal, and for the record, his goal is always higher than mine, was around 1.5 to 1.7 million for this launch. I wasn't even in the millions, guys. So just know that my goals are never like that. But this was based on Devin's understanding of the numbers, something again that I'm terrible at. So we've done a lot of testing at this point, and we know that this price point of 997 works well for my audience, especially when we give them a payment plan. 
And we've done a similar launch to this webinars that convert was really similar to what we did with courses that convert. And we've been running a lot of automated webinars for webinars that convert. So we had some really good data to pull from in terms of what works, what doesn't work, what we're converting at all that good stuff. So it took us a lot of time to kind of get to this point, but This is what Devin's advice was. He said, you know, you can't just go into a launch and say, I want to make a million dollars with my launch and then deliver up some ads, send some really good emails to your list and, you know, post on Facebook and Instagram and all that good stuff and cross your fingers that your webinars are going to convert. He said that it doesn't work that way. It truly is a numbers game and the numbers actually take some time to perfect. So Devin says you have to work backwards. If you've launched in the past, take your conversion rate from past experiences and then use that number to determine where you're going. So for example, if our webinar registrants convert around 10% and we're selling a $1,000 product, then we'll need 10,000 people to register for our webinars to generate a million dollars in sales. So this is why I love webinars so much, because when you do them over and over and over again, and you work them into your launches, you get better and better and better. And as your conversion rate goes up, you can start to understand, okay, how many people do I need to get on my webinar to convert at this rate to make this amount of money? So you can do the numbers. So for us, we had over 20,000 people sign up for our webinars. So a lot of those people came from our email list but even more came from our Facebook ad traffic. So since we knew that we usually convert around 10% and that's a number that's specific to me, you might be converting at 2% or 3%. It's all relative. So just understanding where you're converting and then knowing how many people need to register for your webinars to get to the number that you want to get to. So setting goals is a great idea, but having some analytics to back it up, to make it real plays a huge part in this whole mix. So just something to think about. Now I want to talk to you about video ads because you all know, if you follow my podcast or anything I do, I do not love making videos. I don't like seeing myself on video and I just don't like even the process of making videos and don't even get me started with lighting and videos. Ugh, Facebook live is going to be the death of me with my lighting issues. But as a side note, I'm getting it under control. I had somebody come to my house, help me with some lighting. I want one space in my house to do my video. So it's always set up. So I'm getting there, but I'm not there yet. So anyway, we started with video ads at a point in the launch when our cost began to increase due to audience and creative fatigue with our static image ads. So typically we always run ads where there's an image about my launch. Maybe I'm in the image, maybe I'm not, but those typically are the type of ads we run on Facebook. But because I started to experiment with Facebook live more, I said to Jonathan and Devin, what do you guys think about turning some of my Facebook live videos that are focused on course creation into ads? So they said, okay, we'll give it a try. And we got an additional 16.6% above that fatigue point when we started to use more Facebook ads versus static image ads. So the lesson for us is we're always going to use static image ads. That's just what I feel most comfortable doing. But when we get to a point where there's fatigue and what I mean by fatigue is your cost starts rising. So there's only so many times you can show ads to an audience before they're not going to respond like they did in the beginning. So when you meet that point where there's fatigue and your cost per lead starts to increase, you've got to change something up. And what we did is we added some Facebook live video that I did and then turned into Facebook ads. And that's interesting because my Facebook lives were long, like 15, 20, 25 minutes. And I'm going to guess that as I get better with this and make shorter Facebook live videos that I turn into ads, they're probably going to convert even better. So we'll talk about Facebook live into ads in a second, but I just wanted to actually talk about the strategy here that when you hit a fatigue point, think about changing things up, video ads injected new life into our campaigns and allowed us to reach a really big goal with over 14,000 leads coming from Facebook ads during this launch. 
Now, when I asked Jonathan about this, he said, probably this worked because different people respond to different stimulus. So basically some people love to watch videos. Others will never watch a video. He said, some people will never even look at a static image ad on Facebook, but other people will watch every video that hits their newsfeed. So because we're all different in terms of how we take in information, you got to change things up. So I think he's totally on point here. We had over 2000 leads generated just from my Facebook live videos that we turned into ads. And he actually, Jonathan said that at one point we had as much as 41.1% cheaper in some of our cold traffic scenarios with our Facebook video ads versus our static ads. So some of those ads were 41% cheaper, which is pretty cool. So he said the video ads seem to perform better in cold traffic as opposed to traffic to my own Facebook fans or my own email list. You know, you have to make some guesses here, but perhaps the video format is more compelling to people who don't know much about my brand. And so they're going to watch a video to kind of pay closer attention. So that was interesting for us as well. Again, we're kind of new at this whole thing with FB live turning into video ads, but we found that it converted best with cold traffic. Weird, right? Okay. So let's talk really quickly about these Facebook video ads. What I did is that I knew going into a Facebook live on my Facebook page that I knew it would be turned into an ad. So I was very careful about the flow of that video. Now, at one point I did a Facebook live for that 24 hour bonus. And when I went on Facebook live, it was a little bit awkward, but I didn't answer any of the questions. I wanted to stay right on point. So I jumped on and said, okay, guys, I just want to let you know that I'm doing a 24 hour bonus. So if you've been following me for courses that convert in terms of you were on the webinar, you've been getting my emails, you're thinking about joining the course, but you're not really sure. I wanted to answer some questions that come up a lot for those that are kind of still on the fence. And then I wanted to encourage you to go to, and I gave him a URL and sign up if you are thinking about doing so, because right now we have a special bonus that's going away at midnight. So I talked about the bonus. I talked about the frequently asked questions of people that were on the fence. And then I was out and I wanted to make it like 10 minutes. It probably was like 12 to 15 minutes, but I didn't answer a bunch of questions because I didn't want the video to go any longer. Now it was awkward because some guys like, hello, are you seeing my comment? (laughs) I just had to ignore it. But then after the video, I went back in and I answered a bunch of questions in the comments. So I don't know. This is all experimentation. We're all kind of guessing until we get it right for our own brand, but that video converted well. So it cost us $160 to run that Facebook live as a video ad. And we made $8,000 with it. So, I mean, it definitely worked. That's just eight people that signed up when they saw that video, which doesn't seem like a lot, but $8,000 seems like a lot. So to me, that worked. We just ran it for a few hours, but I always go into a Facebook live with the understanding, okay, is this going to eventually be an ad or is it not going to be an ad? Now, I don't think that you don't ever answer comments when it's going to be an ad, but in that situation, I needed that video to stay short. So I just couldn't get into all the questions. So as I experiment with this more and more, I promise you, I'll come back on my podcast and share with you what's working, what's not working. But this was just our initial experience with Facebook ads and specifically not just Facebook ads, but turning a Facebook live video into an ad. The reason I like that best is because I don't need fancy production. I don't need to have a video crew come over. Facebook live is so much more forgiving. People expect it to be off the cuff and not so polished. So that's a good thing. So a few more things that worked with Facebook ads, we really got competitive with our research this time. So what I mean by that is usually we target seven different targeting groups. And this time we did over 20 because we wanted to at least attract 14,000 leads, if not more with our Facebook ads. And in order to do that, we needed to get more strategic with who we were targeting. So when I asked Jonathan, okay, so how do we get competitive with our research? And he said, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. Running ads is Jonathan's profession, but he said, one piece of advice I would give your listeners is that you want to one, go on instinct. 
And you really want to pay attention to habits and behaviors of those that you are targeting. And you want to get creative with that. So he said, this takes time to understand, but he wanted to give an example. And I love this. He said, I'm always looking for crossover audiences. So for instance, people who surf have a higher than average chance of being interested in training Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but let's just go with it. So he said, that's a weird connection. I know, but once I figured it out, I helped a friend grow his business by 120% given that we live in a beach town with lots of surfers. So I can't tell you exactly how to figure out those crossover audiences, but I can tell you that the more you study your targeting groups, the more you research who to target and then maybe where there might be some alignment or overlap or some weird crossover audiences like Jonathan spelled out here, the better you'll get at targeting. And this is something maybe I'll bring up with Rick Mulready when we have another Facebook ad session, because I think targeting is a hot topic that many of us struggle with. But what I want to tell you is that we targeted more Facebook pages this time. We found those crossover audiences when we could. We targeted more ideas like entrepreneurial moms versus just Facebook pages. So we tried a lot of different things. Some of it stuck, some of it didn't. But I want to encourage you to experiment with your targeting more so than anything else you do with Facebook ads, because you just might find that golden targeting group that is going to get you a lot of results. But if you stay inside your little comfort zone of these are the five pages I always target, you're not going to be able to expand. So something to think about. Okay. Moving on to my final section, a few things that didn't necessarily work. So we also tried Instagram ads. And the great thing is that 15% of our leads came from Instagram. So that's a really good thing. We're talking high numbers right now. However, what we noticed is that not all of our targeting groups that we used on Facebook actually converted on Instagram, because you know that you can set up Instagram ads from your Facebook ads dashboard because Facebook owns Instagram. So because of that, we thought, okay, great. So this targeting group's working really well on Facebook. So now we're going to target them on Instagram. It doesn't necessarily work that way. What we found is that if a target group is converting really well on mobile, via Facebook, then that usually converts well on Instagram, which makes sense because Instagram is a mobile app. And so what we decided to do then is we would only target the audiences on Instagram if they did well on mobile on Facebook. So figuring that out was a little pricey for us because we didn't know that in the beginning, but that is one of the things that we found that kind of saved us in the end. We actually were really careful. So if you have a tight budget, but you want to use Instagram ads, keep that one tip in mind, go for those mobile target groups that work well on Facebook. Another thing is we tried a black background on Instagram and it failed miserably. So we still come back to the old saying that yellow works really, really well in ads in general. And we know it works really well on our Facebook ads, but we now know that yellow works really well on our Instagram ads as well. Jonathan says, you know, the concept here is disrupting the scroll with a high contrast ad image. And I think definitely that works well for Instagram. So I just wanted to kind of give you a few things like in terms of what didn't work, Instagram ads weren't working for us until we kind of figured out those few little tweaks to make it work. So there you go. Okay. So guess what? We made it to the end. Woo. That was a lot to cover. Thanks for staying with me. If you're still here to the very end, you deserve a little happy dance because wow, that was a little bit intense, but I wanted to make sure I got it all into one episode and I hope you found it valuable. Now, two things. First, if you want to see the final emails I sent out on closing day, I've included them as my freebie for today's episode. It's the exact copy I used for email two and three and email number one. I'm going to tweak for you a little bit to show you what it should have looked like because I kind of missed the mark with that first email going out. So if you want my copy, you want to go to amyporterfield.com forward slash 116 download or text the phrase 116 download to the number three, three, four, four, four. 
And second, the goal of this episode is to give you an in the trenches, here's what worked, here's what didn't work kind of view of my recent launch. As I mentioned in the intro, take what you like, leave what does not serve you right now in your business, and also use it to fuel you and your business to keep moving forward. That's truly how I hope you approach this episode. No comparison games, no getting down on yourself if you're just starting out. This is all exciting stuff that you can move toward as you keep moving forward in your business. So thank you so very much for tuning in. I'm so glad we got to spend this time together and I want to give you a little teaser for next week. Next week is another episode with my go-to ads guy, Rick Mulready, and we are going to be focusing on Facebook ad retargeting. So I'm going to ask him a bunch of questions about how to retarget, when to retarget, special strategies for retargeting. We're getting into it all. So that will be episode number 117. I can't wait to see you there. And until then, have a wonderful week. I can't wait to connect with you again soon. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast at www.amyporterfield.com. 